Um, he'll all stand for the. Are we? I'm sorry. Are we ready to go, Daniel? Okay. We stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you. If I can have the clerk call the roll, please. Commissioner Leo Molitor? Present. Commissioner Nora Dukas? Here. Chair Richard Rodriguez? Here. Commissioner Stephen Onstott? Here. Commissioner Michael Wessner? Here. Thank you. Um, item four on the agenda, uh, public comments. This is the time in the, the agenda to set aside for uh, citizen comments on matters uh, not appearing on the agenda today. Um, I don't see any hands, and I don't have any speaker cards on non-agenda items. So, continue with um, item five, AP09-003 uh, is continued, uh, which was continued previously. It's uh, continued again to October 1st, 09, at the request of staff. Okay. Item six, um, LC09001. And LC09002 and LC09 003, the Shipley Ranch Neighbor Conservancy, the Nature Conservancy, and uh, JD McGrath Farms and Jennifer Amati uh, items. Uh, Andrea, does the staff report this morning? Yes, good, good morning. I'm Andrea Osdi with the Planning Division. And this year, I have the new LCA contract proposals. I saw you last year, almost exactly a year ago, and we had a lot more proposals. We had nearly 30, and this year we have only four. So it's a different kind of a year, but there's a little twist on that because we have our very first open space contract proposal. So we can talk about that a little bit today, too. You probably have received the two comment letters that we just received this morning. I haven't had a chance to review that. We've just quickly skimmed it so we can see what the issues are that were, were raised, but we'll leave that up to you as to what you'd like to do with the information in there since we, we haven't had a chance to address that in the, the staff report. So this year we have the, the 2009 LCA Land Conservation Act contracts, also known as the Williamson Act. In 1965, the state introduced the Williamson Act, and this allowed uh, open space and agricultural owners, farmers and ranchers, to, to receive property tax reductions in exchange for promising to keep their land in agriculture or open space. And this has been a really effective land use tool in this county and in other counties in keeping development to the areas that were already developed and keeping open spaces just that. The county in 1969 first adopted its first set of guidelines, and we've had many revisions over the years. The most recent one was in, in 2006, which is when we introduced the option for the open space contracts. And it's been three years, and we have had no bites on that, but this year was the, the first one that we have. And as you saw in your, your packet, that is the McGrath property at Olivas Park and Victoria just on the Ventura side of the Santa Clara River. And the Nature Conservancy is involved in that and is proposing to acquire a part of that. There's a subdivision involved with that and they're proposing to acquire the, the southern portion and keep that in open space. The tax reduction calculation is prescribed by state law. That's nothing that the, the county works on. We just calculate that. So the, the assessor's office takes state law uses that and determines what the appropriate tax benefit will be to the owners, depending on the, the size of the property, the amount of, of land that's in agriculture. There are a variety of factors that are, that are involved in making that calculation. Non-renewal is also one way of dealing with the, the I guess, the, the interest to develop land that has previously been been locked up by the LCA contract. So there's the option for property owners or the county to enter into what's called a notice of non-renewal. And what that does is that stops the clock as far as the, the non-renewal or as far as the, the renewal goes. So on January 1st of the following year, the clock starts to wind down either 10 years or, or 20 years depending on the, the contract. Those are the two types that we have, 10-year and 20-year contracts. The amount of tax reduction goes from about 
10% to 35, that's the range, and as soon as the, the non-renewal begins on January 1st, then immediately that percentage drops. That depends on, again, a variety of factors, but um, the percentage, it, it's a huge hit in the first year after non-renewal. We have had no proposals for non-renewals this year, but the deadline to apply for that is October 1st. We may get some, we don't know, I haven't heard of any coming in, but that will be provided to you later, that information once we, we have that. Also, historically, you've received maps showing the amount of agriculture or the amount of contracts that will be coming out with non-renewals in the next five or 10 years, and that's gonna be coming to you after October 1st as well. Eligibility is something that we review when we're trying to determine whether contracts will be allowed to be either new ones coming in or rescission re-entries. So we look and make sure that each new parcel configuration is eligible on its own independently, even if it's involved in a subdivision where a larger piece of land is being subdivided. We need to make sure that the resulting parcels were, will on their own be eligible to continue with that contract. With agriculture, it's a lot easier. We take the, the parcel size, we have a calculation for the amount of, of land that needs to be in agriculture, and we need to see that there's a, a history of, of agriculture on the land, and it's pretty simple, it's pretty cut and dried. For open space, it's a little different. There, it's more subjective. We look at the, the biological resources on the, the site. We get the Department of Fish and Game to chime in, provide their input if they believe this is a, a good use of the land to, to put it in open space wildlife contract. And also our internal review with our planning division biologist, she reviews that and she lets us know if that would be a, a good parcel to place into a contract. The subvention report also is prepared at the a little bit later, not, not just yet. We wait until the, the October 1st deadline for non-renewals. Then the assessor's office prepares a subvention report and determines what the amount of, of, um, of money it is that we will get back, the reimbursement from the state as being part of the, the LCA program. This year, as you've probably heard, the state budget cuts have been significant. The LCA program has been drastically hit and I've spoken with the assessor's office and they, they're considering not even making the effort to apply for the subvention. There, there's $1,000 statewide to provide to all the counties and ours is not even one of the, the largest agricultural counties. Last year we received $330,000 in subventions and this year it'll be very, very minimal. The three specific proposals that we have are in front of you. You've got the aerial photographs and also the location maps. We have only one proposal for a new contract, and that is the, the Tash Amade project up on Som in Somis on Balcom Canyon. That's about 30 acres, and nearly the entire parcel is, is in agriculture. So that was that, that pretty cut and dry calculation that I described earlier. This is the only new proposal that we have. So only about 30 acres would be added to the LCA program this year. The other three are two, well, one is a rescission reentry in conjunction with a lot line adjustment that is up in Ojai, LC 090001, the Shipley Ranch. And what they are proposing to do is a lot line adjustment because there's a, a structure, an old historic structure built over the property line and they wanna make sure that that is meet setbacks and is on the correct parcel. And so that just created a, a string of requirements including a zone change from open space to AE and, and back again for the amounts of land that are being exchanged. And of course the, the LCA rescission reentry. So it's one of those small projects that turns into a, a big project. And then finally, we have the McGrath and Nature Conservancy project at Olivas Park in Victoria. And those pictures, you can see all of the, the aerials on, in the location maps and descriptions in exhibits two and three in your, your report. The zone change I just described to you, it's about 12,000 square feet of land being exchanged either way. It's, it's nothing that we consider to be a huge impact. There's no increase in, in density. It's just a, a straight exchange of, of property. The area that's being added to the LCA program this year, as I mentioned, is 30 acres. At the end of the year, on December 31st, there will be 10 acres coming out of contract. So that, that's pretty much a, a wash. There's not a, a huge change in, in the amount of land 
that's in contract in the county. And the, the current total is at about 130,000 acres. All of the 2009 contracts comply with the State Williamson Act, the county LCA guidelines, the general plan, and the zoning ordinance. Last week on September 2nd, we went to the to APAC, the um, Agricultural Advisory Council, Policy Advisory Council, and they unanimously approved each of the, the four contracts before you today. The uh, Board of Supervisors hearing is scheduled for November 10th, so a couple of months from now, and uh, your recommendation today will be brought forward to the Board for the, the final decision. Public notice was made in the Ventura County Star and neighbors within 300 feet of each of the properties as well as the planning directors of cities that are within one mile of the project site. We received a couple of phone calls and, and inquiries from the public. Uh, one was uh, in relation to the, the Tash Amade uh, property because there was some concern that this was a continuation or was related to the previous project that was before you, the wedding CUP. And these are two independent projects. One has nothing to do with the other. This one is um, complies with all of the, the LCA guidelines, everything that I described to you. So there's no issue with respect to the, the wedding CUP. So that property owner was um, no longer had their concerns. And there was one more or two more letters that came in just this morning. I received them and you, you just got those. And again, we haven't had a chance to, to fully investigate everything that's described in there. The recommended actions for, for this project or for the three projects are that you find that the LCA and FSCA LCA contracts for items A through C are categorically exempt from CEQA that you find that the proposed zone change for item A is categorically exempt from CEQA, that you adopt all the proposed findings for items A through C set forth in sections C and D of the staff report, adopt the proposed findings for items A and B for the rescission reentries as set forth in section E1 of the staff report, adopt the proposed findings for item A for LCA contract involving a lot line adjustment as set forth in section E2, Adopt the proposed findings for item B and establish a new farmland security zone area as set forth in section F1. Adopt the proposed zone change findings set for in section G. Adopt an ordinance amending the Ventura County Non-Coastal Zoning Ordinance to reflect the zone change number ZN090001 effective upon recordation of the contract for item A and expand the existing agricultural preserve to include the new area zoned AE40. Approve and execute the new LCA contract for item C as set forth in section B1. Direct the county clerk recorder to record the new LCA contract described in the staff report as item C after the owner of the subject property and the chair of the board have executed the respective LCA contract. Approve and execute the contract rescission reentries for items described in the staff report as A and B, subject to the full satisfaction of the specific contingencies for each respective item as set forth in section B2, as determined by the planning director. And finally, direct the county clerk recorder to record the contract rescission reentries described in the staff report as items A and B after each owner of the subject properties and the chair of the board has executed the respective LCA or FSCA LCA contract and after each respective case specific contingencies have been satisfied as determined by the planning director. And that is the conclusion of my presentation unless you have questions. Thank you. Um, uh, I would just make a comment maybe uh, uh, as we move through this item if you've got a few minutes to sit and review those those letters that came in you might be able to comment or staff might be able to comment to them before the meeting is over okay um, okay disclosures uh, bear with me while I read this declaration um, at this time I'd like to ask each uh, planning commissioner commissioner to state for the record whether or not he or she has received any oral or written ex parte communication regarding this agenda item 
that is not already contained in the record before us on this matter. And please disclose the substance of that information only if that information is not contained in the record before us on this matter. Commissioner Molitor. I have no disclosure. Commissioner Dukas. I have none. Commissioner Wessner. I have none. Commissioner Dostop. I have none. And I have none. Uh, Chair Rodriguez, uh, would I be able to ask a question of the of the staff now? Or, or would you rather wait until they come back and have have reviewed those letters? Um, no, I don't. I don't have a problem doing it now. Um, it might it might give them the opportunity to to respond if they can't fully answer your question right now. We have a question, Andre. First of all, I'd like to thank the planning department for the wonderful aerial photographs and the maps of these areas. That's something we've been interested in the past, and you've done a wonderful job. My only question is, um, now that the state has practically wiped out the amount of money, do you have any information that the county is going to start raising property taxes on these parcels because they're not receiving that income? I don't have any information about that. I know that the assessor's office cannot change the rate at which they they calculate that. They have their formulas and they need to stick with that. So I know that they can't make their adjustments based on the, the state problems or the state budget crisis that we've been experiencing. So you don't anticipate, at least for the near future, that these property taxes on these uh, Williamson properties, uh, act properties, would be raised? Well, the, if I could interject. <clears throat> yes. Um, the state budget, as she was saying, has no effect on the taxation of the property. It's, it's directly related to what the Revenue Taxation Code says the property will tax. In, in LCA contracts, it's usually based on the income of the farm production. If that changes as a result of the economy, then that would have an impact on their potential taxes for the LCA property. But the county has absolutely no authority to raise the taxes or change the uh, tax structure methodology that's used to, to tax the properties that are under LCA contracts or any property in the county for that matter. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A couple of quick items too. I just spoke with Nancy Francis and what we would like to um, just make an adjustment on, I think it was number seven, on action number seven, and that is that the zone change will not be effective at the time the contract is recorded. The zone change will be effective 30 days after approved by the Board of Supervisors. And also, the two letters that you've received, the issues that are raised in those two letters will be addressed at the time of the, the conservation subdivision review, which is in process right now. So that subdivision has not yet been scheduled for hearing or even deemed complete, but the, the compatibility issues that are raised there will be discussed in the initial study with respect to that, that project. So hopefully that, that helps answer that question for you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, if I may real quick, just to follow up. So <clears throat> let me understand if that review is forthcoming. Mm -hmm. If we make a decision today, does that affect that process? No, the, the Land Conservation Act contract cannot be recorded without that conservation subdivision going through. So everything just remains on hold. It's the same for the lot line adjustment, the Shipley Ranch as well. If the zone change, if nothing else goes through, if the, the lot line adjustment doesn't happen, the LCA rescission reentry doesn't happen either. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is the public hearing on this matter. Um, I don't have any speaker cards on this item. Is there anybody in the audience that uh, neglected to complete a card and wishes to speak on the item? Okay, with that then I guess we will close the public hearing. Uh, uh, move forward with uh, comments and deliberations. Can I Mr. Chair, I thought we were going to get some comments, any additional uh, from the letter. Um, the concern of uh, approving an open space next to an organic, uh, the confusion appears to be 
if the staff could comment a little bit on that. I, I think that the comment that we had on that was this is an LCA contract that's in association with the subdivision. The LCA itself had an exemption from CEQA. The subdivision does not. So the land use compatibility issues can appropriately be addressed in the negative declaration or the MND, the environmental document that we prepare for the subdivision part. Um, however, I think it should be noted that you know any property owner can change their property into open space. It doesn't necessarily have to be farm because it's AE zoning. Uh, but the issues raised here will be addressed in the subsequent environmental document that we prepare. And um, as Andrea said, the LCA cannot move forward without the subdivision moving forward. So I think that's that's the answer to this letter that we received as we just received it last night. And we don't have time to appropriately go through it, nor does it really have uh, impacts on the LCA contract portion of it itself. My only concern was we have the, the right to farm ordinance sitting out there also. And I remember the numerous discussions we had between organic farmers and commercial farmers and all that. So uh, again, I don't know if that would come into play also with doing your deliberations. Because uh, you're making it open sp available for open space versus farming or agriculture. I think that we can. I, I think that we can appropriately address those issues at a different stage. I don't think it's the appropriate time in the LCA portion to do it. Okay, I just want to make sure it's all considered together. Thank you. Okay, am I am I reading this wrong? Because it looks like the letters are nearly identical, with the exception of uh, a paragraph being or a bullet point being repeated, and the concerns have to, as I read them, have to do with. That drainage would somehow be changed by allowing this uh, this farm to, to go to open space instead of farming. Is there uh, any evidence of that, or do we just uh, do we have any anything that could could uh, just handle that right now? That that seems like. Uh, one of their concerns that uh, that caught my attention. And the okay. other, the other ones. Um, don't seem to be about any subdivision. They seem to be about uh, not having farmland. Oh well, the other one that's that caught my attention was also um, having public access to this open space. Is are there plans for there to be a, uh, access to the McGrath open space? The details of what they're proposing to do are are not yet locked in. What they are hoping to do is keep the land in agriculture for, right now it's an undetermined amount of time, but as long as possible for the time being because they receive an income for renting that, that property out. They, they're farming strawberries out there and it makes sense for them to, to have the income while they're still trying to gather up and purchase the remaining properties along the Santa Clara River. So there's not much that they can do in the way of the open space portion of the, the project until they've done that. And they just need it to start. It doesn't look very well connected to any um, public access that I'm aware of. No, but their aim is to eventually purchase as much of the, that bordering Santa Clara River as possible down to the ocean. I also want to make one comment about the distinction between the letters. It's it's located at the v uh, beginning, first sentence of the second paragraph, in that we're talking about one particular assessor parcel number in one letter and two parcel numbers in another letter. So we are talking about either different portions of the same operation, probably. But their concerns appear to be identical to me. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so. Um, Drainage wouldn't change, and the drainage wouldn't change as, as a result of, of what we're considering here. Is that correct? The drainage, as far as whether it's a, the LCA contract is agricultural That's or open That's one of their space. concerns. One of their concerns uh, on both of the letters, uh, th these bullets aren't numbered. Drainage is not something that we review as part of the... We are concerned that the removal of the subject property from agriculture and conversion to open space slash wildlife habitat will adversely affect drainage of the subject property and therefore the drainage mm -hmm. onto, through, and from our property. Would um, the drainage be affected by this LCA contract? Perhaps I could help if yeah. you interject here if, if okay. and clarify some things. An LCA contract has nothing really to do with land use. It doesn't change any of the land uses. If we put aside the LCA contract, this property owner could 
at any time switches property from agriculture to open space because that's allowed in the zone. Under the LCA contract, the property owner is merely entering into agreement to keep his land in a certain, um, in this case it would be open space, for a certain amount of time in exchange for a certain perhaps tax break. But it doesn't affect the land use. If this wasn't on the table, the property owner could still put his land in open space regardless. That was one point. The second point is I think if, if we need to understand the chronology of what's going on here, because the LCA contracts only come once a year, we're putting a little bit of the horse before the, cor the, the, horse before the cart, in that this LCA contract won't even go into effect until after you have reviewed the subdivision, and the subdivision's been approved, and then if that is approved, and during that whole process is what Kim was alluding to, We'll do a full bone sequel analysis, depending on where it goes, as far as the document. You'll be able to review that subdivision, recommend approval or denial of that. If you recommend approval, subject to the dealing with perhaps some of these drainage issues, then it goes to the board. If the board approves the subdivision, then after the subdivision is complete, then the LCA contract would go into effect. And that would be only after it had been determined that this subdivision was proper. Although the, the and all the findings were made. The conservation subdivision is a planning director. Oh, is it just planning director approved? Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, so the issues would nonetheless be reviewed by the planning director. Okay, I just wanted to be satisfied that we weren't simply ignoring two letters because they came in in the morning. It, it seemed like the two meaty points were public access and this uh, idea that somehow drainage would affect this uh, adjacent farmer's property. Thank you. Okay, the only other comment, comment I would make right now is that uh, the two letters talk about adjacent property, but it, they don't specify exactly where it's at. I, are we, we're to assume that it's on either left and right of this there, picture right. as we see it? There are those two strips on either side of the McGrath property. Okay, thank you. No other questions, comments? Uh, do I have a motion? I'd like to move approval of the recommended actions. Second. Yeah, that, 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 approval, a uh, motion and a second. I think we had a comment that, from staff about. Yeah, it's, so you, that includes the amendment to number seven as far as the affected uh, approval dates that they gave us? Yes. Okay, with, uh, with the inclusion of the edit to number seven as recommended by staff. Uh, all of those. Oh, and do we need to do we need to have these uh, these letters entered into the record? I don't see an exhibit stamp on them. Yes, well, mine has. They do have. They do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We have uh, for the record. We've uh, received from uh, uh, two documents uh, on this item that are marked as Exhibit A and Exhibit B. Um, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passed. Okay. Moving on um, to item seven. Proposed amendment to the county non-coastal zoning ordinance related to parking and loading requirements. County of Ventura, the applicant. Uh, planner, uh, Lorraine Aruga. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Pleasure to be here. I'm Lorraine Rubin, a uh, grant writer and planner with the planning division. I'd also like to introduce uh, Katie Matchett. Katie is, when I introduced her to you back in June when we did our presentation was an intern and she's now uh, staff with us. We're very lucky about that. Excuse me, Lorraine, can you pull up there? Yes, I'm having a little difficult hard time here too. How's that? Is that better? I think I think it will be. This weren't made for tall people. Um, I'd also like to introduce um, Keith Turner, former planning director with uh, the planning division, and Keith has also helped us out with this project. Um, and I can't tell you how helpful it is when you're proposing to change language and code to understand the historical context of why it was written the way it was. And that's just one of the things that Keith has brought to our project. So um, we're here today to present a proposal to amend the non-coastal zoning ordinance um, with regard to parking and loading requirements. 
um, it's a comprehensive update that we're presenting to you um, in terms not only of content and how we regulate parking, but also in terms of structure uh, and how things are organized in the zoning ordinance. So it's pretty much a top to bottom overhaul. So we do have a lot to cover today. Um, we were here in June to provide you sort of a flyover look at what we were um, looking at with this project. And so today we have a PowerPoint to go into more detail with you. Um, and so there's about 60 slides and, and we'll go into, we'll go through those slides and I would suggest just asking questions um, as we go along in terms of process, okay? Okay. So I have a tool here. Okay. Um, we were able to do this project because we got grant funding from SCAG, Southern California Association of Governments. Um, this is um, important because we don't get a chance to update or overhaul so comprehensively our code um, without funding like this. So this is kind of a rare opportunity for the planning division. Um, and the focus of the grant that we got was um, to go after transportation land use policies um, that it was really sort of an energy focus. We wanted to um, look at things we could do in our code to improve transportation, maximize mobility, and sort of pursue some smart growth initiatives. And so um, parking, parking you might think is mundane and insignificant, but we're land use planners, and our job is to design cities well. And um, as we look back over the last few decades and how we've done in terms of planning, um, we see that we've kind of done a few things wrong because of our focus around the automobile. And um, so in our box of tools as land use planners, it turns out that the car, how we design around the car, is actually a very powerful tool in how we design our cities well. So parking is not mundane, the parking code is not mundane, it's actually a very significant uh, tool uh, that we have in terms of land use planners. So. That's our funding. Um, again, the proposal is comprehensive. And because um, it is so comprehensive, uh, the proposal is to actually repeal and reenact all of Article 8, which is where the parking regulations um, reside. And then we have other changes uh, to the code uh, throughout the zoning ordinance that are necessary to be consistent with the code, the, the proposed changes. Um, I'll go into the purpose of, of the update and what our goals were. And it really falls into three categories. Um, we have some fairly significant new state and local objectives that we're trying to meet. Uh, clarity and comprehensiveness. The code right now is a matter of a few pages in the zoning ordinance. Um, we're offering a lot more detail now to provide clarity to land use planners in implementing the code, as well as to applicants in understanding what our expectations are. And then consistency with current uh, practices and trends. Our code um, hasn't been updated in a while. And just a little more detail on these. Um, one of the state objectives that we are looking at is very significant, and that is to um, do our part to help with greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And we're directed to do that um, by AB 32 and SB 375. And it asks us to look at the land use planning tools that we do have available to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And it's largely vehicle miles traveled is what we're looking at. So parking code is actually, when you see the list of things that land use planners can do, updating parking code is, is there. And so we will, be, we will be doing that with this update. Another very big um, mandate that's headed our way or that, that is here is um, to address stormwater management more aggressively. And uh, as you know, the county recently um, uh, the permit for stormwater is recently approved for our county, and so we're looking at much more ambitious um, management strategies for stormwater, and we've integrated some of that into this proposed code. And then back in 2007, we approved a countywide bicycle master plan, and it did recommend that we adopt um, ordinance for bicycle parking, and so we, we do that in this code. And then in terms of clarity and comprehensiveness, again, to clarify parking and loading requirements 
explain methodology for calculating. There, there can be a lot of confusion simply on how you're supposed to do the math. So we've tried to clarify that. And then we've added a lot more detail um, in terms of things like dimension, what our expectations are for landscaping, things like that. Uh-oh. Uh, consistency with current trends and practices. Most of the parking requirements were written back in the 80s. Surprising how good they are, it's not how old they are. Um, but um, anyway, our updates are intended to achieve some of the more modern goals of alternative means of transportation and um, a better focus on the environment. In terms of our methodology, we um, reviewed requirements uh, of other jurisdictions. We consulted standard industry uh, practices and references. Uh, we assessed parking conditions at existing land uses and then we sought out expertise um, and uh, stakeholder input. And um, this is the, a list of some of the codes that we've got in our files that we've been referring to. They're, they're codes from both cities and counties in California and outside of the state. And um, this is a very helpful reference to sort of know how other jurisdictions are approaching this. Um, and then, you know, the, some of the standard industry references, the parking generation manual, um, the Urban Land Use Institute has some tools that are commonly used. Um, and so those are some of the references we worked with. And then we uh, looked at existing facilities. This is uh, some fast food restaurants in Miramonte. Um, we have this aerial imagery, which has just proved fabulous for this project. We can look at, we can measure square footage of buildings and number of parking stalls and uh, see how much the parking is used, at least when the photo was taken. So we've made use of a lot of aerial imagery. Um, we did site visits and we did a lot of interviews with planning staff and as well as public works and other agency staff. Um, sought uh, expert and stakeholder input. Um, we've been working with public works transportation, also their water resources division, the watershed protection district building and safety and fire. Uh, we held a public workshop in June and got some good input. Um, and we've also gotten input from some consulting firms that um, offered very nice detailed feedback on some of our proposals. Um, and we've got feedback from local groups like BC Cool, the Ojai Municipal Advisory Group, and uh, some really good help from local bicycle groups. I just want to mention that a complementary document that we're working on right now um, is a design guidelines document that will be sort of an administrative tool for implementing the proposed code. They have a lot more detail, photos, diagrams, measurements, examples, to, just to give staff a lot more um, guidance on how to implement um, these, these uh, requirements um, and, hope, and applicants as well. So that's in the works. So uh, this uh, presentation is organized, in, uh, it follows the organization of the staff report in terms of we're organizing it around what we perceive to be the key changes in the code. And those basically fall into 11 categories and, and that's how we're gonna go through these. And I'll just jump right in. Um, the first um, one is that there's a very detailed purpose statement. And I, I would actually ask you to look at that if if you could look at exhibit two on page, on, on the fourth page of uh, the proposed amendment, it's the first page of article eight, where we have the purpose statement. You'll see, that that's a whole page purpose statement. And, and uh, this is sort of important to, to uh, notice because it's a big, sort of a philosophical shift here with this amendment. Our last purpose statement was um, sort of woven in with... Uh, I'm sorry, could you, we go by certain pages in here and we're... 60. 60, thank you, uh, my apologies. Yeah. Thank you, 60. 
And what I want to point out there is that formerly the purpose that we had in our zoning ordinance for parking was largely to provide sort of convenient and ample parking. Are we okay? Is everybody? All right. Yep. Yeah, I okay. think we're on board. All right. So we had sort of a very simple purpose statement before, which was really the focus was that we were trying to make it fairly convenient to park and to provide enough. And now we're acknowledging that there are more goals, that, that we are balancing more things than just convenient and ample parking. And so that is what this purpose statement is laying out, is what are all the things we have to balance when we look at parking. And um, one of the things that we're doing in this code is we're we're suggesting that we have more, f we offer more flexibility to parking, and I'm going to talk more, or parking regulation, and I'll talk more about that as we go, but if you're going to add flexibility in how you implement regulations, it's really important that you have a strong and clear purpose statement so that you can always come back to it and say, okay, is the thing we're suggesting to adjust over here in line with our c clear and stated purpose? So. Um, that is why it's so uh, lengthy, and um, and we've organized it in terms of um, some themes, and those themes are mobility, flexibility, resource conservation, and human scaled urban form, and um, <laughs> um, Mobility, we're going to get into all of these things, so I'm not going to spend too much time here, but it's just other ways of getting around besides the traditional automobile. We need to also provide for pedestrians and bicyclists. Flexibility in terms of how we implement the requirements on a case-by-case -case basis. Resource conservation, there's a lot of environmental issues that are presented with parking. And human scaled urban form, the gentleman asked me what that means and my answer was intimacy, basically. We're, our cities have become, our urban centers have sometimes become impersonal and car oriented and we're trying to bring it down to more human scale where we feel comfortable and safe walking. So that's the purpose statement, um, and I just wanted to point out to you how comprehensive it is. Okay, so now we're going to dive into applicability. And um, because many of the projects that we get in the unincorporated area are not necessarily new projects, they are existing projects that are being adjusted or changed or expanded. It's really important to understand when do the new requirements apply, when do you only have to bring the new spaces up to the new code, and when do you have to bring the entire parking lot up to the new code? Because why would we make a wonderful new code if it actually never gets, um, if we're never required to apply it to even existing projects? So there's at some point, it needs to be applied. So the applicability section attempts to um, address that as clearly as possible. And I, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned at the beginning, there is an errata that was given to you um, uh, that came after you received your packets. And most of the thing, all of the things in there were minor grammatical um, adjustments except one thing that related to the applicability section. And I'm gonna cover that right now. And um, Excuse me, you're referring to the document marked as uh, Exhibit 12? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and so what happened was in our, at, at, we went back and forth on how to, to explain applicability and in our going back and forth, back and forth with how to word that properly, we just got on the wrong side of the number that we were trying to use. So we switched those numbers back. Okay, so um, the threshold for bringing the entire parking area up to current requirements. It, it, what we're proposing is an increase to the number of parking spaces of at least five spaces or 10%. Five. If it's four or less, you, you only apply the regulations to the existing spaces. I'm 
I'm sorry? Yeah. On number one on the errata sheet, for land uses with 52 or fewer existing motor vehicle parking spaces, and when four or fewer new motor vehicle parking spaces are required, only the additional required motor vehicle parking spaces, um, oops, that should be, shall be required to comply with all the provisions of this article. And so what number two is saying is that when five or more are required, five or more spaces, then all of the provisions of the article apply. If you'd like, I have a, this slide in the next that might make it clear. I could try to explain. The wording may still need to be tweaked, but. So what we're trying to show in this slide is on going down on the left slide is the number of existing. Me, have you got a pointer, Andy? It might help. Thank you. Right here. That's the number of existing parking spaces. And across the top is the number of new spaces that a use might be adding. So if you're adding four or less new spaces, everything in white, what we're saying is only the new spaces must comply with the new requirements. So there's a cutoff right here. Um, and, and another cutoff is if you have 10% or more new spaces, then you have to, the new um, requirements apply. So that's everything here in this color. And so the point is, if you have a small project, say you have a, a project with 15 spaces, you, you could add up to four spaces and not be required to um, bring the whole project up to the requirements. But if you, get it, if you were to add five spaces, then that throws you over the threshold and the whole parking area needs to comply. But if you have a large project, if you have 100 existing spaces, then that fourth threshold doesn't apply anymore and in, in the threshold is over here. It's at 10%. So there's two thresholds, one to take into account um, to, to, to address small and large projects. So let me go to this. If there's any questions on this, I'll go to the next slide. It also sort of walks you through it. So in the case of a new land use, it's straightforward. The entire parking area must comply. Then we have changes to our expansions of land uses. And so the first question that we ask is, are more spaces required? And if the answer is no, there's no more spaces required. Then, then there's no requirements that we're going to apply to your project relative to parking, except we would like you to add some bike racks if that would be required in the code. That's one thing that we're trying to, we, we would like to ask if you come in to see us and uh, to get a permit and it's appropriate to add some bike racks, we're suggesting that that would be appropriate. But if more, if more spaces are required of your project, then the, the next question is, uh, does your project meet current space requirements? If the current code says your nail salon should have six spaces, does your nail salon have six spaces? And so if the answer is no, then, then you, you have to comply with um, all the requirements of Article 8. But the answer is yes, my, my nail salon does have all the spaces. Then we have these, th that's when these thresholds come in, this 52 or 53. And we've actually put the numbers there instead of just saying in the code five spaces or 10% because that's confusing. We put the numbers. What does that mean? When you, when you do the math, it means 52 spaces or 53 spaces. And so if you have 52 or fewer spaces, then we get to the less than uh, or equal to five spaces required. That throws you into the requirement of having to comply with all of the requirements. And if it's less than four spaces, then it's just the new spaces that need to comply. And again, if we go back, 
that's the white right there. If you're a large parking lot and you have 53 or more spaces, then that's when the 10% threshold is used. And uh, if you have more than 10%, 10% or more, the entire parking area must comply. And if you have um, less than or equal to 9%, then it's just the new spaces. Believe it or not, that's as clear as we could make that. <laughs> so are there any questions? So the number of parking spaces and not necessarily the size of the lot was the thing that drove the <laughs> drove, um, drove this, uh, this cutoff? Yes. And what about the, um, the new s size of the parking space? We're not going to do subcompact parking spaces anymore, is that correct? What we're proposing is that the size of a compact stall be increased and that we add some restrictions on when it's used, generally not used in high turnover situations. And so it was considered how that shook hands with this, I don't know, this, this number, the four versus the five, the 10 percent, the nine percent, the cutoff, the, the, the actual amount of space that you had on the land and the different size requirement we're going to have for the size of the parking space, this all, this all works mathematically. Well, what we're looking at, these are for existing uses, so we're looking at the existing spaces and we would look at the existing size of those spaces to decide you know, wh which part of the cutoff they land on. And, and there's flexibility built in with the planning director to, to if, if there's some um, eventuality where it doesn't seem to make sense to follow the exact letter, there's some flexibility with uh, human judgment on what works and what doesn't? Yeah, and we're going to spend a fair amount of time explaining that, the, that in minutes. Okay, I'm relieved to hear that. Okay. Uh, Lorraine, just for clarification, on your example up there where you used, you know, less than 52, uh, I'll take your example of uh, the four. Mm -hmm. um, did you say that if you looked at a project, uh, an applicant, and they were authorized to have six spaces, um, or let's say three spaces, and they wanted to need to do an increase, um, they had to bring the whole thing, all the additional spaces up to compliance with the, with the new Section 8 uh, amendments? Uh, can you go? Your question is if they had three spaces. Well, if they had less than the required number of spaces that they were authorized, I guess, when the permits were approved. Yeah. How, how were you going to deal with that? Oh, that's a good question. And that gets even more complicated. Um, the way we're doing that is Okay, let's say you're, uh, you were permitted in the 1800s and you're a bakery. And at that time, you were legal, right? You were meeting the current requirements. So b now you want to come in and switch to a different but similar use. What, we're, what we look at to answer the question, uh, are more spaces required? That first question is based on the, c based on the current code. So you don't say what was required back in 1800. You say what's required now for a bakery and what the change you're doing, what's required of that. So if I'm a bakery and the code now says I have to have eight spaces and I'm changing over here to nail salon and that also now requires eight spaces for the same square footage, I have enough spaces I, because I'm comparing current code to current code. And that's how you address the non, what we call non-conforming, or those uses that were, for whatever reason, uh, whatever, for whatever reason, uh, don't have enough spaces. Whether it was, um, you know, when they were, uh, yeah. Thank we you. spent a lot of time on this part, and I know it seems complicated, but I, th I think we've 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 addressed it pretty thoroughly. <laughs> so shall I go on? Okay. Please. Oh, actually, I've got some examples. Um, so I'll go through these kind of quickly. This is an example of going from a, a bank to a medical office. 
so this is a change example. It's a change to the use. Okay, so let's say the existing square foot is 4,800 square feet. On the ground, right now, they have 20 spaces. They're changing to a medical office. They're not changing the square footage. The code says for that use, you have to have 24 spaces. So they have 20. They need 24, so they have to add four spaces for these requirements. So since the land use has 52 or fewer uh, existing spaces and we'll be adding four or fewer new spaces, the current requirements apply only to the new spaces. And again, uh, the short-term bicycle parking, if it's required for that use, we'd like to see it, okay? And then the, another example, an expansion. Expansion of a retail nursery. So they have 30,000 square feet and on the ground they have 55 spaces. They're expanding to 4,600 square feet and that requires per the code 84 spaces. So the difference there is 29 spaces or 35% increase. So they started out with more than 50, they had 53 or more spaces and they're adding more than 10%. So that's a significant, that's a 35% change. That's significant enough that we put that in the category of you need to bring the whole thing up to current requirements. Okay, different topic. Uh, Decision-making flexibility within prescribed standards. Um, this section of the code discusses um, the planning director's authority to modify or waive requirements under cir certain circumstances. There's two places in the code where we kind of talk thoroughly about the planning director's authority. This one is you're actually modifying or changing, you know, things like um, landscaping or some of the other requirements. There's another section where it's really just number of spaces. So this isn't the, so much the number of spaces section, this is sort of all the other stuff. Um, currently, the existing park, parking requirements give the planning director fairly broad authority with this regard. The language says it's based on the type of use, location of use, number of employees, traffic generated, and good planning practice. So those are sort of the boundaries that's written in the code. How about the financial consequences to the applicant? That's not written in the code. Is that a subject of consideration? N short answer, no. <laughs> um, yes, there's always a financial consequence. The question is what is the public purpose that is being uh, derived from any regulatory framework like we're talking about and uh, the biggest issue that we've heard with regard to these or, or any standards is tell us what is required up front and be clear and consistent. That's what we hear, not necessarily that we are requiring minimum parking. Okay, so I wanted to contrast the current um, um, discretion with what we're proposing and what we're proposing is that the planning director um, may modify or waive the requirements um, based on written findings and they have to demonstrate that there's consistency with the purpose which we talked about and with uh, section 8108, 8101-4.10 which is director interpretation of requirements and standards. Um, that the modification or waiver will not adversely affect existing or potential land uses adjoining or in the vicinity of the site and that it's supported by substantial evidence. So, we, you know, we feel like we've put some boundaries because we've, we're adding a fair amount of uh, flexibility but, but within boundaries and we want to see the reasons and that it meets the purpose. Is there any appeal to the planning director's decision on this? That's a good question. I don't know exactly procedurally how that would work. It's my understanding in the code there's a general um, provision that any aggrieved party may appeal a decision of any of the planning director, of the planning commission, up to the next level. So the planning director appeal, the planning director would come to the planning commission, and the appeal of the planning commission would go to the board of supervisors. Okay, number four, strategies to reduce parking oversupply. 
um, we've got a number of provisions that we're suggesting in the code to um, reduce parking oversupply. Uh, the reasons we're trying to do this are again to meet the stormwater mandates to make our uh, park our urban areas more uh, friendly for walking and all of that so by oversupply we just mean too much we're just trying to make it right um, and so those provisions are a reduced sp parking space requirements number of parking spaces required is both the minimum required and the maximum allowed we're allowing shared parking, that's very significant. We have stronger carpool incentives and we've suggested relaxing uh, tandem parking restrictions. Um, so in terms of the rates, parking rates, this is the formulas that are in the table to assign number of spaces by use. Um, we're suggest we've made adjustments to the rates um, in the table. Um, I'm just going to quickly jump to the next slide. We've added new uses to the table, 26 of them. Uh, uses where the rate is directly decreased. We didn't change the formula. It's just a lower number is eight uses. And uses where we're suggesting a different formula is 30. So mostly what we did was add new uses and, and, and offer a different formula. Um, and again, by, by doing that, by making the parking rates um, more accurate, we allow for a higher valued use of space, which gets to the economic question, um, encourages the use of alternative transportation modes, and creates vibrant pedestrian friendly communities, and it reduces cost of development. And I apologize, this is one, was, uh, one of the exhibits where we compared rates, the existing rates and the proposed rates. Um, and I offer this just to show you, these are the ones where there was a direct decrease. And every time we made a change, we did a lot of research and analysis as to why. And so I just sort of to give you a flavor of the research that went into these, because um, I don't know that you want to get into each one, but um, I wanted to just go through this one that, where we decreased them. Um, in automobile repairing, for example, we had just one space per 150 square feet of gross floor area. And it can be um, confusing in automobile repairing if we are counting the spaces that are meant for parking your um, vehicles that you're working on. So really what we're doing here is we're making it clear that we're not counting that space. That's not really parking. And um, we're separating the space that you're using for automobile and office um, because there can be a lot of different situations with automobile repairing your large or small office. And so this, this we felt was a more precise way of approaching <coughs> automobile repairing. I noticed we had a comment letter specifically about that in the packet um, at counting the spaces. Something I just recently ran into in the county of Los Angeles is then the ADA requirement for handicap accessibility. Was that taken into consideration here as far as being able to move a wheelchair from point A to point B after leaving a repaired vehicle? I just, just wanted to, just because the county of Los Angeles raised it on a project I've got. Um, well, the, meeting those regulations is something that's implemented and enforced by the Building and Safety Department. So really, all we do in our code is reference the, the Federal ADA Act and the Building Code, and that projects have to be in compliance with that. Okay. So. Thank you. Um, golf courses. Um, we added a subcategory. When you look at golf courses, there's a lot of different uses. There's restaurants and a lot of different um, things you can be doing on a golf course. And we added commercial use as one of the things you look at that has a different um, rate for square footage. So that was the change there. Um, or actually, no, it had a one for square footage. And we, we increased, we uh, changed the number to actually lower the amount of parking for commercial. Um, to be more in line with industry standards. Libraries, again, um, it's a modest change to the number to be more in line with what's expected at libraries. Um, offices, generally, you have medical offices, you get the most demand at medical offices, and you get less demand where there's not people going in and out like at 
our, our office, government office, and so that's you know very much an industry standard what we're proposing. Um, the next one is uh, sort of an unusual use, but really that's just offices at public service utilities. We made that consistent. Um, theaters where the rate is based on seats, that's a more uh, consistent um, rate in terms of what others are doing and, and industry is finding to be accurate. And then the requirement uh, that many storage, it's a modest change that you know, th those situations can be really different and it's probably more appropriate to have the decision-making body decide the number of spaces. And then single family residential dwellings. We used to have, uh, I, um, we used to have break that out into four categories. The largest one being eight or more bedrooms needed five spaces. And we're suggesting we don't need four subdivisions there. We just need three categories for residential. The largest being six or more bedrooms needs four spaces. So. So that is a, a potential reduction there for, for large, larger houses. So that's an example of the types of changes. We really aren't making radical changes to rates. Uh, we do understand that we're the unincorporated county. We're pretty spread out. We don't have a lot of alternative transportation available um, with enough frequency to ratchet down parking to try to increase use of those modes of transportation. So these adjustments are fairly minor. They're, we're not looking at anything radical. Excuse me, I have a question on mm -hmm. that last, bottom of that last slide, residential uses. Um, since we recently had a, a project come before us on Piru, um, as this goes forward and these, and these amendments are, are approved, um, can you tell me whether what we approved, say, two months ago, uh, would be uh, governed by the old ordinance or by the what we're passing now once construction starts? Mm -hmm. Maybe the staff tell me that? Well, my understanding is that once the project is approved, the requirements in place at the time apply. Is that accurate? I'm getting a head nod. Okay, thank you. Okay, another way to reduce parking over, uh, over supply is this one, and what we're suggesting is that the number that appears in the rate table is actually not just the minimum, that's how we used to view it, but it's the minimum and the maximum. And, and um, that it's the minimum and the maximum within a 10% cushion, plus or minus 10%. And, um, the goal again here is to uh, to send the message that you just can't build as much parking as you want. That we do want to reduce pavement and all those impacts. So we, we, we want to have parking be just enough but not too much. And so um, many jurisdictions that have um, you know dense urban areas and lots of alternative transportations are going with just maximums. Um, we are suggesting that we have the number more accurate and that if we say it's the minimum and maximum within a 10% buffer, that, that that's pretty good. We're, we're, we're pretty close. And then if you add to that these adjustment mechanisms that we'll talk about where the planning director can approve an adjustment with up to a 20% adjustment number of spaces, that, that that's probably a, a good way to approach it. That doesn't apply to residential. Residential is still the minimum. The number is the minimum. And I'm going to show you what that plus or minus 10% looks like here. Here's a couple of examples, a small and a large example. One, the small example being a Wendy's fast food restaurant and the large being a Bond's grocery store. So if you had a small uh, Wendy's fast food restaurant, commonly about 3,000 square feet, um, our requirement uh, is one space per 90 square feet, so that's 33 spaces. If you give that a plus or minus 10%, that's a sort of a cushion or a nudge factor, of just three spaces. It's not super significant. But it might really make a difference in the development, the layout, 
you know, you just don't have room for that last space, whatever it is, it, it gives a little flexibility there. And then in Vons, it's a 40,000 square feet, the rate one per 250 square feet, 160 spaces required, a plus or minus 10% in that case would look like 16 spaces. So again, relative to 160, it's, it's not a lot, but it's probably enough to, to, to help in some cases. Uh, this is done, we've, we modeled this after Olympia does this, uh, plus or minus. Some codes have a, min a minimum column and a maximum column, and they have various mechanisms for desi de deciding which rate applies. Um, we felt this was easier administratively. Do you have a question? Oh, no, thank you. I was going to say, uh, uh, we're going to need to take about a five-minute break here shortly. If there's a point in your presentation, we, it's convenient to take that break. I'd like to do that. Um, let me just do this slide, and I think that'll be good. Great. Um, this is just sort of editorial on, on what we get when we're looking at uh, approaching the rate this way with the minimum and the maximum is that um, – you know, our parking policy needs to also look at trying to reduce vehicle miles traveled, greenhouse gas emissions, stormwater management, mobility, housing affordability, and community design. So, so that is why we looked at offering up these maximums. Okay. 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 Uh, we're going to take about a five-minute break. Be right back. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, if we can come back into session, uh, Lorraine. Okay. You have to forgive my glasses. I have an eye issue, and I tried to not use them, but I can't. So, sorry about that. <clears throat> so, we are back to our list of uh, major issues. Um, number four, uh, again, um, on strategies to reduce parking oversupply. One of the one of the re things that really excited that we're going to be able to put into this code is something that is common now in, in other codes, and that's allowing shared parking. It's a very simple thing. It doesn't hurt very much, and uh, it, you, you get a lot of gain from it. And this aerial is, uh, if you're familiar with Ventura, where Cabrillo Middle School is, and that's a church up in the left-hand corner. And that's one parking lot shared by two uses. And that's the classic example of shared parking where your demands for parking are at different days or times. And so what codes do is they say, yes, you can have shared parking if you do an analysis that show your demands are such. And then you put a legal agreement together to, to lock it in so we're covered. <clears throat> and so we've written that into our code. Um, we've also um, changed carpool requirements to make them a little stronger. The threshold in the old code was in the transportation demand management section, and it had a threshold of 100 spaces before you needed to assign carpool parking spaces, and we've lowered that to if you have 35 employees or 25 students. Uh, we'd like to see carpool pool parking spaces. Um, but we don't want those spaces um, locked up all day if they weren't used. So you, your uh, signage should only indicate that they have to be made available one af hour after a normal work shift would begin. And that's to incentivize um, carpooling. Tandem parking offers um, opportunities to reduce parking um, and costs. Um, in our current code, we limit, restrict tandem parking to mobile homes and mobile home parks. And so we're suggesting that we um, relax that and allow it for all residential uses. Um, in multifamily, up to half of that would need to be, or only up to half of the required parking uh, could be tandem, and uh, both spaces need to serve the same dwelling. And now we're on to adjustments to parking space requirements. Um, and here we added uh, provisions to allow the number of required motor vehicle spaces to be increased or decreased under certain circumstances. And this is that second part of the code I mentioned where we, we have planning director discretion. And these are to discretion to the number of spaces. And what we're suggesting is that up to 20% change, increase or decrease, if, it, if you go through these procedures we've outlined and the planning director thinks it's okay that it would be a planning director who would have the discretion to make that approval, beyond that would be our traditional <coughs> variance process. So that is what this is suggesting. Um, we've outlined in the code certain documentation that's required and um, some monitoring is involved. Planning director must approve it. And then some of the justifications that a use might use was just to be to offer a parking study. And you know, when you study parking, you realize really quickly that it depends. It's really not like other land use planning issues where it's just the setback is this and it works for most cases, the building height's this and it works for most cases. There's so many variables with parking. So you really do need to offer the opportunity for somebody to just come in and say, hey, we're not a normal grocery store. We're a Trader Joe's and, you know, we need a lot of parking. So, so that's what a parking study does. It's just an opportunity to show why you're different than what we've got in our code. Uh, different means of transportation, demand management, that just means things you do to encourage biking. You might put showers in for your employees, things like that. Affordable or senior housing, of course. There's much more less demand for uh, parking in those cases sometimes. Drive-through uses may not need as much parking. Parking reserve, and that's a case where your project might be phased 
um, and you don't want to put in all the parking now, or um, a, a use, we might not know the demand, so we might say, um, yeah, we'll let you put in 20% less, but you gotta landscape that 20% because we think maybe it's gonna be needed and it needs to be made available in, in reserve for the future to be used as parking. And that's a common tool. And then those are just some, there's other thing, justifications that could be used. And then provisions to support alternative means of transportation. Uh, one of the things, as I mentioned, was that bicycle parking spaces, both short and long term, must be provided for many uses. And I'll get into what that means in just a second. Um, but just to, to show you some of the research we did and looking at how much bicycle parking we should require by different uses, we looked at the, our existing county bicycle master plan. We compared uh, requirements from other jurisdictions. LEAD, the Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design has some guidelines there. And also there's some climate change recommendations that we looked at. So short and long term, it's, it's common in codes to require the two kinds. Short term being generally bike racks. And these are meant for um, visitors, customers, and um, those that require storage were just really up to a few hours. And in the table of parking rates, um, the way we base the number of bicycle parking spaces, bicycle rack spaces, is generally on the percentage of motor vehicle spaces that it's required. And there's sort of a range from three to eight percent. And long-term bicycle parking is intended for employees. These bo both of these shots are here at the government center um, for students, for residents or commuters, and they generally need to park for extended periods of time, including overnight. And uh, for the most part in the code, that requirement doesn't get tripped until you've got 25 employees. And not a lot of our uses actually have 25 employees, so that wouldn't actually come into play a lot. We also put in there some detailed design requirements for bicycle racks and lockers. Um, a lot of the racks out there are actually not appropriate for bicycles. They're called wheel benders. You generally want two points of contact on the frame. If you, We've been collecting pictures of um, bicycle racks, and we went in to put a, an example of a good one, and all we had was a collection of bad ones with the bicycles you know, not standing up, because a lot of the designs, the wavy ones that you see, they just don't work. So. So using um, some recommendations from different bicycle organizations and other codes, we have some design criteria. And it's not difficult, just that simple, you know, uh, metal loop into the ground works. And also you will find that they're at nighttime or dusk, they're trip hazards mm -hmm. that people then fall and people get sued. So, That's um, right. Because again, they're so low, the wheel bender fashion. So it's, uh, I'm glad to see this though, maybe an aesthetic issue as we go along. Yeah. But I just wanted to, to put that in. Yeah. And we have some space requirements around the footprint of the, of the bicycle rack. And then the design criteria include things like location. We don't really want it that far away from the entrance. We need to make it as convenient to bike as it is to park your car. Um, and so bike racks need to be within 100 feet, long-term bicycle parking we're suggesting within 400 feet of the building entrance. Okay, and then there, there's a whole list of uh, provisions that we're suggesting to reduce the environmental impacts, and, and I'll go through, the, through those now. Um, one of them is for pervious, um, to increase stormwater infiltration. And so one of the ways we do that is with pervious surfaces. And so um, we haven't required the use of pervious surface in this code, but we have explicitly allowed for its use and outlined if you're going to use it, how that might be done. Um, and it's very likely that soon the stormwater management folks will, uh, be, will craft how they're going to um, condition projects to require this in some cases. But there are some issues with pervious surface. I was sort of surprised to learn you think something so simple as infiltration would be easy, but 
we have a lot of clay soils in Ventura County, groundwater is rising in some areas, you know, just things you kind of have to work out. And um, we also need some sort of solid design specifications that we can point to. So those are things that, that are yet to be worked out. So we encourage it and we allow it within the parameters, you know, it has to meet the fire uh, district's requirements if there's a fire access road. Um, and um, we need to see certain things on the engineering plans that it's adequate for the weight of the vehicles and things like that. One of the impacts of parking is that they create many urban heat islands because they're dark um, and they absorb heat. Um, they actually raise the temperature of the surrounding environment fairly significantly, which then increases cooling costs and demands. And so um, one of the things that can be done to mitigate that is actually to use a light colored surface. And um, y it's not too uncommon to see sometimes either concrete used instead, or you can do a, sort of a light concrete top coat um, instead of the really, really dark pavements. And so we, uh, we don't require that, but we are certainly encouraging it. Um, other things that um, to, in terms of uh, minimizing impervious surface that um, are in the code is the standard, we've changed the dimensions of some of our, our um, parking area elements. The, the standard space length was reduced from 20 feet long to 18 feet long. It's more of an industry standard. Um, Parallel space length was reduced uh, from 24 to 22 feet. Drive aisle width was reduced a foot to 24 feet. Um, the number of driveways is limited to one in most cases. That would, if you want to do more than one, <coughs> that would need to go through the public works agency. Uh, driveway widths are minimized. Um, and, and as we said, restrictions on tandem parking relax, and we also explicitly allow now for ribbon driveways like pictured. <coughs> we have some new provisions for lighting that are focused mostly on energy efficiency and night sky lighting. And what the code, the draft code says is that all, all new fixtures must be what's called fully cut off to prevent light from going above the horizontal plane. And um, what current requirements now um, call for in the building code is um, you have to have fully cut off lights if your fixture is over 175 watts. So we are actually covered, um, but we're just saying all of them. If it's you know 100 watts, we still want it to be fully cut off. And again, that just means the, the direction of the light doesn't shine above the horizontal plane. It's directed down to prevent um, night sky lighting. And then added a requirement that a light serving non-residential uses should be extinguished during non-working hours. So basically they're not left on all night if they're not needed. And there's a number of things you can do in your um, parking areas to improve circulation, which of course reduces driving and then promotes walking. Um, and cross access is one of them. And cross access is just when you don't have to go out onto the main street via a driveway and back in through another driveway. And you just can, um, this is an example here with one shopping center, another shopping center, and you can just drive straight across. That's cross access, that's cross access. And it, there's a lot of good things about it, and so we're encouraging it. And um, <coughs> we outline some requirements if you're going to use cross access. It would require an agreement between the parties so that it's, it stays in place, things like that. Um, improving trash collection in parking lots. We added a provision that if you have um, 20 spaces or more, you have to put in a, a trash receptacle uh, for the use of people using the parking lot, both trash and recyclables receptacle. And then after the first 20 spaces for every 80 spaces thereafter um, to put in another set of them. And that is an important mandate for stormwater, keeping the water clean. <coughs> And then facilitating stormwater management landscaping. 
and this is often called like bioretention, you'll hear that word. Um, and parking lots actually offer an important opportunity to collect stormwater from the project, and so we do want to allow that. We're not mandating that you put in stormwater management planters again, but we are telling the applicant, if you do, here's what we'd like to see. And there's some issues here with uh, landscaping in that the goals that you're after with uh, stormwater management landscaping are sometimes not the same as the goals you're after with parking area mitigation landscaping. For example, on the right slide, that's a classic berm that's used to sort of shield parking lots from the street. It blocks the <coughs> glare of the lights and makes them nicer to look at. Uh, that's in contrast to what you see in stormwater management landscaping, which is a depression to hold water. So, uh, you know, we need to make sure that if you're going to do a, burn, uh, a depression um, and not a berm, that you're, for example, not putting your trees in the middle of it, which we're seeing actually a lot of. So we have um, rules that, you know, you got to make enough room, leave enough room to keep your trees up out of the bottom of the channel and things like that. These are new, these landscaping um, methods are new, and so um, we think these safeguards will, will help uh, ensure success. We have a lot more landscaping requirements for parking areas in the code. Formerly, the requirements for landscaping were in the county's landscape design guidelines, which is a supplementary document um, that talks about everything from water conservation to how you ins design your irrigation system. And they tended to get lost, the landscaping requirements. So we've moved them into the code. And um, we've added a purpose statement to really clarify what are we after when we do these, when we require landscaping, so that it's clear what, what our primary goals are with landscaping. And the primary goals are, as shown in these pictures, primarily really screening the parking lot, again, a glare issue and aesthetics, and shading. There are many others, but those are the two primary. And this is just a quick summary showing you kind of the main differences uh, between old landscaping requirements and the current one. The planter width requirement adjacent to streets used to be five feet in commercial, 10 feet in industrial, and we um, made that consistently eight feet. In interior, the, the, the generally the landscaping requirements are broken up into perimeter and interior. And so in the interior, uh, we used to require one tree per 10 adjacent spaces, and now we're suggesting one per four so it's more trees. Um, but the percentage of interior landscaping you'll see is actually not 10% anymore, it's 6%. Um, and something to know is that these numbers, you know, I, I don't think it, we worked with a landscape architect on this, John Innes, who's been with us doing consulting work for decades. And he said those numbers, you know, they don't really get used that much, uh, those percentage numbers. What really matters and what architects look at is how many trees per number of stalls do, is required and have we met those goals. It doesn't often happen that, that the math, the percentage gets checked. And if you, if you tell them exactly how you want laid out, you're going to get the coverage you need. And if you look at a parking lot that has one tree per eight spaces, that's pretty shady and it, we felt sufficiently landscaped. Um, we did put the caveat in there that because we have a lot of small projects, that, that let's say you have a parking lot with only eight spaces, and we have a lot of small projects like that. If you did just the perimeter requirement landscape of that eight foot buffer, that would be over 10% of the area of that parking uh, in landscaping. And so we felt that was enough that that you've, you've met the requirement and so you wouldn't need to meet the, the additional 6% on the interior. And then finally, in terms of layout, the uh, current requirements really don't specify what we want to see 
and lay out, and we felt this was re important, and we offer a lot of guidance on really what we want to see in terms of finger planters and tree wells and locations and things like that. We do offer, um, there is a section that kind of spells out in some detail uh, p possible ways of um, approaching the goals of landscaping if there's not enough space on site to meet some of the requirements. And some of the substitutions that are offered up is if, if you use a light colored high albedo paving surface, that's a, that's a benefit and meet some of the goals. Uh, potentially the installation of public art could meet the goal of making the parking area uh, more aesthetically pleasing. And then offering alternative ways of shading the parking area, such as using canopies that are topped with solar photovoltaic systems and so on. Hitler, I have a question. Commissioner mm -hmm. Adukas. How um, that installation of public art, how I, I can see, you know, someone who, who wants to put up uh, kiosks that advertise businesses and jewelry stores and movies and, you know, and call it art because it's got decorative elements on the kiosk. How, how is that determined? Well, it, you mentioned that last time, and we did add into the code the requirement that it could not include advertising. But beyond that, it requires planning director approval. We don't have an art commission or anything like that we can point to. Okay, so it's not, we're not going to get little mini billboards and call, call it art. If we say there can be no advertising. Okay, so. thank you. Okay. We've also made explicit allowance for the use in parking lots of structures that uh, hold solar systems or even green roofs, which is roofs planted with vegetation to largely to capture stored storm water. And they would have to meet, we outline that they still have to meet, you know, zoning requirements such as height and setback limits. Okay. Um, next, we have requirements to that uh, really get into the form, our, our community design issues, and how can we make parking lots, um, design them in such a way, locate them in such a way that our communities are more walkable and more human scaled. And um, I'll go into all of these uh, slide by slide. Um, pedestrian safe access. We've added a lot of references throughout the code to ensure p uh, safe pedestrian access. One requirement is that we want to see a pathway from the sidewalk to the entrance. And um, ideally, that would be really close because your parking is going to be behind. But, you know, if it's not, if you have a big parking lot and a use, we want to see a safe way for someone who took the time to walk or ride the bus to safely get to the entrance. So we outlined those requirements. Um, then things like if the pedestrian route crosses a driveway, we'd like to see that clearly marked and designated. Other things you can do in design is actually if you orient your rows perpendicular to the building so that the pedestrian doesn't have to, that there's a nice flow of uh, for the pedestrian to walk uh, to the entrance and doesn't have to cross landscaping. It's a little safer. Um, we have a, we specify that if if you're going to um, have off-site parking, I didn't mention that, but that is something in the code. What well, is in the existing code and still there that in some cases uh, uses can opt for parking off-site. Uh, within certain parameters, and we've added the requirement that for pedestrian safety in those cases. Um, improving the pedestrian environment is one of the things that uh, applicants can use to try to justify a parking space reduction. And some of the things you might do is providing more sidewalks than are required. Um, marking crosswalks, installing additional landscaping, um, adding furniture, street furniture, places for people to sit, all those things that might enhance the pedestrian environment are things we would look at if you're asking for a reduction in parking spaces. And this is really important in terms of making the, the our communities more human scale, and that's where do we locate the parking relative to the street. 
and um, the ideal location, and we put a preference for this in our code. We don't require it because there's so many different situations. We simply outline a preference that you locate it behind the building relative to the street. So that's then the top example where you see that on-street parking, those, that, that type of use typically has you know, more parking in the back, and, and that's what makes a downtown more walkable. And that's where we'd like to see it. A second pre preference or priority is to locate the parking to the side of the building. So you still get the building, the building entrance up front next to the street, and then the parking's on the side. So we outline those preferences in the code. Other things in terms of pedestrian safety, if you can put the access to the site on the street that has the lowest volume traffic, not the primary street here, but the secondary, you design it that way, that's safer for the pedestrian. You can do things with landscaping to make sure that you have clear visibility for pedestrians and that if you have passenger loading turnout areas, they're located so they, they don't impede pedestrian um, circulation. So we just sprinkled the reminder throughout the code to think about pedestrians in your design. Queuing lanes like at a fast food restaurant need to consider how do people walk through there. Loading spaces, the same thing. Cross access, the same thing. And then landscaping for pedestrians. Um, this is sort of just illustrating that one of the one of the reasons why we're requiring much of the landscaping is for um, the pedestrian's uh, uh, enjoyment of the space. Okay, number nine, Rem removal of the requirement for covered parking in some cases. Right now um, in the code on residential land uses, we require that parking be covered. And there's been some problems raised, especially on larger remote uh, properties where you know people are, have to drive down a long driveway to get to their use and you know they get in violation because they don't have their parking covered way out there. And um, that's come up a number of times, and so we've, um, we're suggesting that on lots larger than an acre, located in O-S-A-E-R-A-R-E-R-O or R-T, or T-P zones, that um, we don't require that the parking be covered. The parking space still must be provided, but it doesn't need to be covered. And it's important to know that covered just means what sort of like shows there, it doesn't mean garage right now, it just means covered, and so we see various versions of what covered looks like, and sometimes it can be kind of funky, but. So that's the proposal, one of them. And then another one is <coughs> for other uses where we do require covered parking on smaller lots, that only two of any required residential parking spaces uh, would be covered single or two family. So if you have a large um, hot property with many bedrooms, and let's say we're requiring you to have four parking spaces, what we're proposing is that only two of those would need to be covered. Any questions on that one? Another change is to the parking rate for multifamily units. Um, in the current code, it's a little bit, let me just jump ahead and show you what the current code says. Current code is a little bit hard to understand. It says, you know, it has a studio type dwelling, one covered space. It's a one bedroom dwelling, is one and a quarter spaces. And so what, it's not sort of clear, you know, if you have two bedrooms, you know, how, what the requirement is. Um, and what we've done is added this table to the code after doing research on multifamily parking, looking at different studies that have been done on multifamily parking where it's been shown that the demand for parking in multifamily complexes is more off, is as dependent on the number of bedrooms as it is on whether the parking is assigned to the unit or not. And the reason for that is because different units in a complex have different parking demands and if it's not assigned then it can be shared and it, it levels out, equals out to less demand overall. But if each unit only gets their assigned spaces, you end up needing more spaces. So this is a formula that um, we've put together um, modeling after some other jurisdictions and some studies. 
so that the number of spaces uh, is required is less if the parking is not assigned. And the size of the compact parking space, we're actually proposing to increase it. The current requirements allow compact uh, parking spaces for up to 30% of the spaces. Uh, that does not depend on the type of use. And the size of the stall is quite small, actually, even as, park as compact spaces go. It's seven and a half feet by 15 and a half feet. And um, the sort of the current trend in transportation planners is it's in disfavor, um, compact parking, and it, that sort of that's why that top picture is it just doesn't get used the way it's meant to be used. Um, it gets used by non-compact vehicles, and then you have problems. Um, so what we're proposing is um, some, many jurisdictions are actually eliminating it from the code. What we're suggesting is that we just restrict the use of it to um, uses that don't have a high turnover. So for non-retail uses serving primarily employees, residents, or students, it could be used. And that the size be increased to eight and a half by 16 feet. And that compares to our standard size that we're suggesting of nine feet by 20, or 18 feet. Okay, um, just look, two more slides here. This is just um, to talk about the changes to other sections of the code. There was a lot of ripple effect um, that happened. We um, made Article 8 now apply only to parking regulations. It used to have uh, landscaping requirements in there and it used to have transportation demand management that included other things than parking. So for easier reference, we made Article 8 just apply to parking. We, so there we moved landscaping and we moved transportation demand management elsewhere. Um, and so we also consolidated all parking requirements into Article 8. We had in some cases requirements scattered throughout. We, whenever we could and it made sense, we brought them into the one article. We, we did some reorganizing of the parking rate table in terms of alphabetizing it and so on. And again, we moved the landscaping requirements out of the landscape design guidelines and into the actual code. Uh, we added a number of new definitions, which are in the definition section of the code. And then, then all the other sort of changes that needed to be made for consistency with the changes to parking. I am ready for your questions. Questions? Commissioner Moss, uh, excuse me, I do this. Um, two things um, crossed my mind during your presentation, and, and one was um, there's, there's certain periods of the year where um, shopping centers are just really busy, and you spend a lot of time either waiting for a parking space to get free I know in unincorporated Ventura County, we don't have a lot of those, but was there um, any change to um, the standards that would, you know, worsen Christmas time shopping uh, uh, if, if there were new shopping centers in unincorporated Ventura County? I don't even think we have shopping center in the current. No, it's in here. There is shopping center, and it says it's determined by yeah. And director. I think it still is in the proposed yeah. code, yeah. The thing is, there, to answer your question, there is a philosophical shift in that it's not necessarily the intention to design for parking for the holiday season when the demand is greatest because the suggestion is that that's um, erring a little bit too much on the side of the needs of the convenience of the driver versus our needs to address climate change and clean water. And, and in balancing that, it might be a little less convenient uh, in December to park. And, and what's hoped is that behavior gets modified a little bit too. You m learn to go shopping at a later hour, consolidate your shopping, walk if it's close. There are behavioral modifications that we have room for, even in our unincorporated communities. And um, 
Well, it's okay. I gave I gave kind of a flippant example, but I've seen um, other areas, for example, in Santa Monica, where there's a great deal of congestion. People are still dependent on their cars, and there's a lot of emissions into the air because of people circling around looking for a place to abandon their car. So um, uh, I'm not I'm not sure what were air emissions considered in the crafting of these guidelines too with uh, just the amount of time that you spend, you know, driving around looking for a closer space. Yeah. So that's human nature. Mm -hmm. it, it's one of the variables, and there are many, and so it is. this is a balancing that we have to figure out where's the right place. We actually didn't lower parking significantly, um, and we just tried to get it right. We didn't try to get the below that pain threshold, so... Um, we haven't ratcheted it down such that we know it's going to be a problem in December. We've just tried to sort of make it right, but not too much. So it, it's a gray area. It's a gray okay. area. Okay. Well, it's hard. not just Christmas shopping. It's any place where you have reduced parking and people, you know. Also, new new projects. You know, everybody's curious and everybody comes and there's a shortage of parking and it calms down eventually, but... There's a lot of um, driving around looking for a place, and I was wondering if 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 that was considered in t in crafting these guidelines. Yes, it's yeah. considered. It was. I don't really know what the answer is. Again, it's a there's a continuum. Sky hooks. And um, sky hooks is the answer. I'm sorry. Sky hooks. Sky hooks. Yeah, we just hook ourselves. On, you know, it's it's the future. I'm all for levitation. <laughs> yeah, right. Magic carpets. <laughs> if I may, there's a, a great example right kitty corner to us here. It was Vaughn Shopping Center, and when it opened, it, it hue and cry throughout the city with comments like, "Well, are they finally building a stop a park and ride facility to the Vons? And that's largely died out because what has happened is that people have modified their behavior. They either don't shop there because they are walking, um, they, they, they don't like the fact that they may have to walk, or some people have said, hey, I'll walk. And so, yes, it is full. The other thing, just generically, other than that, that one example, is that there is a shift of retail trade going on, and a tremendous amount is being done by Internet. And so we're getting much more delivery to individual residences as opposed to people driving to a retail shopping center. Things to consider as part of this balancing act. I appreciate that. That, that comes up also with um, uses like parks and community centers where they might four times a year, they do a big thing and they need to spill out in the surrounding area. Do you make the whole, pave the whole thing for those four times or do you accept that it's gonna be a little inconvenient on the neighbors four times a year? So those are the issues we're balancing. Okay, and, and I appreciate that. Um, the other thing I was wondering is uh, with, it's, it appears to be some increases in, in landscaping were water conservation, you know, um, you know where I'm from. Everything, everything is grass and uh, beautiful annuals, and and just the the water shortage uh, that we always seem to go through. Yeah, the answer to that is yeah. that there, what the landscape design guidelines do contain, and what and they do still apply to all of our uses, is requirements to meet water conservation. Um, mandates that are actually set by the state. And so any use still needs to meet that they get a budget of water that's based upon area. And so that, that still applies to every use. So if you can meet that budget with a bunch of turf here and a bunch of something else here, that's what you can do that. You just collectively overall have to meet that budget. And um, the state actually increased um, the expected efficiency of that budget, and the next thing that, that I'll be working on after this is the update to those guidelines to implement that even more strict requirement for water conservation. Interestingly, though, the stormwater management landscapes, you need to use plants that like to be flooded and saturated, and so, you know, we have that, too. <laughs> In the mix, and and I believe last time uh, uh, Commissioner Westner uh, brought up 
uh, ast not astroturf, but you know, artificial, artificial turf. And uh, and did it make its way? I didn't I didn't happen to see it. Did it make its way well, in I here? I honestly or? didn't research that, and I don't have enough information. I mean, it's permeable. We know that it doesn't put off oxygen. We know that. Um, I don't know where that fits in. We actually don't say that plant material has to be living, so we have room for case-by-case -case requests, I would say. Well, I have seen it done very successfully where um, the, the, um, the purpose of the planting area was to guide pedestrians in, and it did not need to be done with, uh, with living, with, with turf that needs water, that needs upkeep. It was, it was done with the artificial turf and, and rocks and, and some trees. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it again was, you know, purpose driven. And it was a, if you could just get past the idea of astroturf, you know, it, to, to me, it seemed like a very successful application of, of, uh, -huh. uh you know, a solution that, right. so it didn't, it, it hasn't it's made its way. It's not in here. I mean, we okay. could explicitly say, the proposals for well, as long as there's materials. the flexibility for it, like you were saying, they don't have to be real. I'm thinking, oh my God, plastic plants. <laughs> but um, but if there is that flexibility, I think that would be um, that'd be good. You probably want to look at that on a case by case basis, I would imagine. So. I'm sure you're right. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to thank Commissioner Dukas for bringing it up, uh, because again, I was going to bring that yeah. back to you. Uh, the reason I've, I've seen it now successfully, uh, particularly in the urban environment, mm -hmm. where they're trying to create uh, obviously dog parks, but also pedestrian accesses. So uh, using the natural turf and all that by having pets and all that winds up not working, becomes a huge maintenance issue. So this is a kind of consideration in these particular uh, areas uh, achieves two purposes, uh, lower maintenance, but also it invites people to take their animals and where they go. So if we're trying to get into this pedestrian maneuvering concept, mm -hmm. um, that's where this um, newer type of materials mm -hmm. uh, are both beneficial, but also uh, what we're trying to achieve here, which is direct people's behavior. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, but I thank you for bringing it up because, again, I think as we go through this, I know it's not the parking requirement, but it goes more to the landscaping, but I got to believe they go in hand in hand at this point. Yeah. But well, that'll be, if we, when I get that done, that'll be coming before you again, and we might have the opportunity to say something in more detail because that, that's really where the, the plant lists belong is in that document. And so, unless you want to say something explicitly in this one, okay. I wanted to know if it was followed up, if it was considered, if if um, we had a prohibition. About it, I didn't know what to do. I didn't yeah. know, you know. Uh huh. I just would like to um, get away from um, grass being used. Yeah. Commissioner Malter. Yes, Rain. I have a few uh, a few questions and a few comments. If you refer to page sixty nine. Excuse me, just, just for yeah. a second. Clarify, County Council. I'm just curious, as I can go through the agenda, does this item require a declaration by the commissioners also? Disclosures, you mean? Disclosure, I'm sorry. No. Okay. okay. You mean I don't have to say I've parked many times within the right. county? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I didn't think o so. Only if, they, only if they talk to you. Before okay. we get into the questions. Okay, I'm Sometimes sorry. Go ahead. Do. Okay, on page 69, the second land use from the bottom, residential care facility, and you've got 0.5 spaces per bed. I, uh, I'm i a long-term care ombudsman in two larger residential care facilities. Believe me, I, I don't have any residents that have vehicles at all. I mean, residential care facilities are for people who are being taken care of, and they usually have medical conditions. So I wish you'd kind of look at that. And also on the next section over, it says staff, one space, one space for 20 residents. They have they have a lot more staff than that. Uh, if you, uh, I have one facility that has like 45 residents, and there are probably seven or eight staff members there, and most of them have cars. So anyway, just just kind of look at that. Unless I'm missing something, that seems to be out of out of whack. 
So uh, what you're saying is that sort of by definition, residential care facilities have clients that don't drive. I'm saying res people who are in residential care facilities are there for some type of medical problem or psychological problem. They, they don't have vehicles. I uh, guess the, the thinking was that, that that covered your visitors. Pardon? I think probably the thinking is that that covers your visitors. Well, to be honest with you, they have very few visitors mm -hmm. too. Well. But that's possible. <laughs> Maybe that's the thing. But th uh -huh. th that still seems high. In, uh, the, in the ones you're familiar with? Pardon? In the facilities you're familiar with, is there excessive parking? Do you know? No. In both of the... Both of the facilities that I service, one can hold up to 50 people, has like 40. They probably have six parking spaces in the facility. The other facility in Ojai has 15, 16 people now, could hold 25 or 30, and they have, I think, two off parking facilities. Um, Another thing is just, just a comment about the size of the compact spaces. I'm glad they're being increased. And you pointed out the difficulty of SUVs parking anywhere, anytime, for any reason. And so often I see that you've got a compact space and a car parks it and two big SUVs parking, that person can't even get out of the car. If, if I could wave my magic wand, I'd have SUVs and trucks parked in a separate area, a whole parking facility set up for them, and not even let them park in regular or compact, but I can't do that, so we can't do that. But that's a problem, I think, is there's no enforcement for parking in compact, for large vehicles or trucks or SUVs parking in compact parking areas, right? So that's just based on goodwill. That's just kind of a frustration I have. Uh, another thing, I didn't see anything about motorhomes being parked on streets. Is right. there anything in the county? Uh, it, it, did I miss anything in here? I mean, cities like um, uh, Ventura now doesn't permit motorhomes to be parked on on a city street um, except for a short period of time to unload and and load. Is there anything, or well, because w if you start parking motorhomes on some of these small uh, roads and streets that we have. Is there anything in here about that? This code addresses Pardon? off this code only addresses off street parking. Right. Off the street parking. Not uh, just to elaborate, the ordinance code has no authority in the public right of way period. That is the jurisdiction okay. of the public works agency. So there's a clear distinction. So we can pass your comments along, no, that's okay. but uh, unfortunately, uh, this code couldn't address those. Yeah. Okay, next thing, I'm not talking about motor scooters or motorcycles, but there, I'm seeing a lot of motor bikes. There are regular bicycles with a real dinky little motor on them. May they park in bicycle parking areas? Um, if they fit in the space, we'd have nothing that um, precludes If it says them. bicycle and I have a motorbike, <clears throat> I can park in that area. We, we didn't define bicycle. Okay. I'm, I, I don't have any problem with, with it, but it's just an incidence that this could come up and someone's going to start citing motorbikes for parking in bicycle areas. Oh, I think we're going to see a lot of interesting types of motor conveyance yes. on that, so all the more reason for your flexible code. Okay, so that's going to be a problem. My last point is just more or less general, and that has to do with, with roundabouts. And I know we're not dealing with this now, but I just came back from another trip. I haven't been any place in the world that doesn't have roundabouts. We have the worst situation of, of roundabouts. And talk about emissions control, cars waiting on these stupid stoplights all the time. I don't know what's happening. But roundabouts help parking, too, because you have fewer fewer lines going through. Anyway, that's just kind of me venting my spleen <laughs> roundabouts. Thank you for your time, and thank you for a good presentation. Other questions? Uh, Commissioner Armstrong? I just have a general
after I read through it the third time, I, I was amazed at how comprehensive it was and how innovative it was and how flexible it is. And you're to be commended and staff to be commended. Okay, thank you. I would concur with that. It's a lot of work, and um, you made it very informative. The slide presentation certainly helped quite a bit. Thank you. We've been carrying our cameras around taking pictures of the parking lots for eight months. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, opening the public. Uh, public hearing on this matter. I have uh, two speaker cards. Before I call, you, call them up, I'd like to uh, make note that we have received uh, earlier this morning uh, two items on this uh, on this particular issue. Uh, exhibit A from a letter from the Environmental Coalition and uh, Exhibit 12, um, as we, we spoke to earlier, uh, added changes to Article 8. Um, Speaker cards I have are for Lisa Woodburn uh, and uh, Barbara Kennedy. Do you want me to go through the recommended actions sorry. first? I'm sorry. I, I apologize. <laughs> no, we got, into, we got into questions, and I saw the end over there, and I, I put my cart in front of my horse. I apologize. Uh, yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> so we have some recommended actions. They're um, fairly comprehensive because they include... Um, both the recommended actions we're asking of you and um, then what goes to the board. Um, so I'm sorry, but I will, I will read the, the first set that your commission take the following actions, um, and that's one, certify that your commission has read and considered the information contained in the negative declaration, Exhibit 6 prepared for this project and has considered the comments received during the public review process. And two, find on the basis of the entire record, including the initial study and any comments received, that there is no substantial evidence that the project will have a significant effect on the environment. And three, find based on the evidence presented in the staff report and at the hearing that the zoning ordinance amendment standards set forth in the non-coastal zoning ordinance um, section 8115 for public health, safety, general welfare, good zoning practice, and consistency with the general plan are met with regard to the proposed zoning ordinance amendment. And four, approve and adopt the attached resolution transmitting your commission's findings to the Board of Supervisors and recommending that the Board of Supervisors approve the proposed zoning ordinance amendment, Exhibit 10. And five, designate the planning director and the resource management agency at 800 South Victoria Avenue, Ventura, California, as the custodian and location of the record of proceedings. And five, recommend to the Board of Supervisors um, the following recommendations. Robert, do I need to read all those? Okay. If I may. One minor correction on Exhibit 9, which is your re draft resolution. It refers to the attached resolution when, in fact, it is the resolution. So it should say this instead of the attached. And that's on Item 3 of Exhibit 9. The recommended actions that were circulated to the public are on page 55 and 56, is that correct? Along with Exhibit 9? Because that's what she read. Okay. 54 and 55. All right, so the public's had opportunity to see both. I guess is my question. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good morning. I'm Lisa Woodburn, and I work at Jensen Design and Survey. We're a uh, land use uh, consulting firm in Ventura. 
Um, I, pre and I apologize up front for not getting my comments in sooner. I was just made aware of these parking changes uh, recently and so hadn't had a, a lot, lot of opportunity to put any comments down. I do want to recommend staff though on you know considerable amount of effort and work that's gone into this and, and I don't really have any um, so, you know big problems with it. I, there's one section in here though that um, being a consultant and working with this on a daily basis I do have some comments and su suggested changes. I don't have the page number in your packet but it was page 20 of the um, of the, the draft changes. It's, it's section 8108-5.1 and it's referring to parking plans. And it asks that um, grading and drainage plans be prepared by a civil engineer prior to and, and also be given to the Public Works Agency Director and the Building and Safety Division Director for their review and comment prior to approval of any land use entitlement. Well, right now we submit preliminary grading and drainage plans to the Public Works Agency for their review as part of our submittal, as part of our regular submittal of a land use entitlement. Um, it's preliminary in nature, it's not final. Um, the final design, all the final preliminary, I mean the final um, grading and drainage plans, those are done as conditions of approval of the project and they're done prior to building permit. Excuse me, Lisa. Uh, mm -hmm. um, we're having difficulty getting that. Back. I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, I can't find the section 8108 what? 5.1. Page stacking, seven. Stacking area? 76. Just okay, sorry, 76. Hold on just a minute. Okay, no problem. Okay, it's at the very top, it says parking plans. My concern is the cost to an applicant to do detailed grading and drainage plans um, prior to approval of any land use entitlement. Um, what if their project doesn't get approved? You know, they're putting a lot of time and money and effort into developing final plans um, when a project might even you know, might not get approved. So what I'm asking is that we pretty much keep in place what we have now. Either add um, the word preliminary after it says corresponding grading and drainage plan, add the word preliminary there. And I'd also ask that it only be referred or reviewed by the Public Works Agency director and not right now we don't have to go to the building and safety division director I'm not quite sure why that's in there um, again the building and safety director would look at it prior to building permit no. being issued so that's that's my comment um, the other thing, I just had a question when Lorraine was talking about the minimums and the maximums and the 10% change. Is that, let's say you're required 33 parking places, but you have the 10% minimum maximum flexibility. So could you, as just a um, an application, come in with less than, um, you know, include that 10% reduction? So let's say you only put 30, and that would that doesn't have to be a um, formal request to the planning director. Okay, all right, that was just a question I had. Um, then the rest of it, I mean, like I said, it, it's one of those things, it's, it's very comprehensive and um, I like the idea that there's flexibility, but it would be nice to be able to come back maybe in a six months or a year and kind of really see how, it, how it's working and, and how it, you know, it's affecting um, property owners. I know some of the things that are happening now, this whole get to excellence idea, I mean, it's, the application form itself is so big and, and some of these changes are just so much information. I mean it's good for us. You know, we're we're getting more <laughs> we're getting more applicants because people feel they can't they can't do this themselves anymore. But um, I just would like to see you know be able to come back and, and just really see how it, it's working. So that's uh, a couple of responses. Uh, first of all, um, 
We agree. I, we don't see a particular problem of asserting the word preliminary grading and drainage plans because um, we agree. Mm -hmm. and having the final uh, plans at that juncture is too much. The reason for the Building and Safety Division Director is because we've actually had a problem of the ADA requirements being imposed and all of a sudden their parking plan has to be changed and they have to go back through a permit adjustment process or even a minor modification to accomplish that. So that's to make sure that everybody who needs to review it is reviewing it at the same time so we don't have the problems of late mm -hmm. hit. Right, the ADA. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, what about the Commissioner Mong, I'll do this. What about the review period? Are we considering a review period to, to see how this is going? We weren't considering a review period. The planning department didn't propose one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara Kennedy. Hi. I'm Barbara Kennedy. I'm the site manager of the Oakview Park and Resource Center in Oakview. Um, that's a county-owned facility that has been paid for by the community through a special tax assessment. Um, I wanted to show my support of the planning director to grant the waivers from the required parking formula, which I understand will help with the flexibility for projects. We have a very unique project where, our, where we're at. Our site is a great example of that. The Oakview Park and Resource Center, which was originally an elementary school, is predominantly used by children. Um, they either walk, they ride their bikes, they take the school bus, they're dropped off at, the, at our site for the programs that we, that we supply. Um, so while there, there's a substantial amount of square footage leased, we've got up to 10,000 square foot at our facility, the reality is there's only a few adults present um, operating the library, the Boys and Girls Club, the Teen Center, the daycare, etc. cetera. Um, we have approximately 16 staff members during the day. Right now I've got 45 parking spaces. The required is 72 by the county. Um, we don't need all those spaces. <laughs> when we have um, um, classes at night, the employees from the daytime have gone home. So that frees up the space, so we use that at this time. We have some additional asphalted area that we use for overflow parking when we have special events, those three or four times a year, or m maybe a few more um, as we progress. Um, but um, um, the ability to have flexibility to use the space in a way that accommodates additional parking when needed such as for special events, but that does not require that so many spaces be completely dedicated to parking only when 90% of the time it isn't necessary would be very helpful. Currently we use an area that is used only partially for the play area, which is the asphalt area I was referring to, um, when we do have that special event that does arise. Your consideration in this issue is very much appreciated. I would be happy to answer, answer any questions you have regarding the parking at the Oakley Park and Resource Center. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Uh no questions. Thank you very much, Lisa. Or Barbara, excuse me. May I just make a comment about that project? Yeah. What can you tell us about that? Well, we looked at we looked at that as one of the sort of real world examples when we were working on this code, and it is um, uh, it's a, a project that's very beneficial to the community, but it has this parking challenge. It used to be a school, and now they're doing these other uses there. Um, they have an auditorium, and whenever you have an auditorium, there's a potential for large assemblies of people, and generally the auditorium uses have a high parking demand because of that. And so um, in, in parking codes, you'll see that whenever there's an auditorium, there's sort of a separate rate for that, and you have to take that into account. Um, but one thing that we thought about in a case like this, and general, well, what do you do in a case like this where it really is just a few times a year, that it doesn't really make sense? And so um, we don't address on-street parking in the code, except for we added one um, thing regarding on-street parking, is that in terms of making an adjustment to the number of parking spaces required, one thing the planning director could consider is the availability of on-street parking. As long as the on-street parking is adjacent to the actual site in question and not the neighbors, um, uh, so it's a consideration that could be taken into account. So in this property, which is a big school with big fields and lots of street frontage, um, it would need an analysis case by case, but it could be that that would be enough relief for this use that has an auditorium and a few times a year. So 
that is something that's written into the adjustment section right now for a case like that. The other thing that goes on there is they have a basketball court, which is a paved surface um, and it could be used for overflow parking on the few times a year that it's needed. So you see that also at churches, on churches you'll see that they'll have basketball courts painted on the, so that's a, it's a great use of pavement, it's double use. And so if we can allow for that in, in uh, the adjustments that we look at, um, I think it's a good thing. I have a question. Uh, maybe you can answer. Maybe uh, maybe Barbara can. Uh, I'm curious. What was the name of the school that was closed, and what's its address? It's Oak View Elementary School at 555 Avoid Okay. Um, and just I don't know if you know. Is that a defined um, evacuation center for the community? It actually is. We already read the document. Yes. Okay. Thank you. A question. Is what you're saying is that this can be resolved, that this can be resolved by the planning director? Her comments and her, her concerns about the parking at that school? Well, this is an existing project with existing requirements. Right. So how that works out now, I'm not exactly sure, but if that use were to come in now or after we adopted the code as drafted, and the planning director could consider on-street parking and have it analyzed, and it looked okay, and Public Works was okay with it, then it would solve the problem. Thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and close the, uh, the public hearing then. Um, I'd like to make a comment before I ask for, for a motion. Um, uh, the reason I asked that question is obvious. Once I, you know, I think once you heard it, um, that in a community, not on not on other communities, not unlike Oakview, there are a limited number of, of locations that are of such capacity or facility that they're capable of handling a large influx of people. Uh, and I suspect something like the gymnasium. Uh, it could also double as a community meeting room. I know I live in uh, in a uh, uh, county beach area uh, in Oxnard, and and we use the the local community uh, elementary school uh, auditorium as a meeting place uh, for business meetings, but a variety of other things as well. So uh, I understand what you're saying, but I also think so. okay. Well, thank you. Okay. Um, can I have a motion? Mr. Chair, I'd like to recommend the uh, adoption of the recommended actions found on pages 54, 55, and 56 of our um, packet with the modification as uh, we have all kind of agreed on, on section 8108.5.1, staff to add preliminary as far as the grading and uh, drainage. That is my motion. And does the motion also include the, the changes that we received identified as, as, as exhibit, exhibit 12? Yes, it does. I'll second. And does the motion also include the correction or to the exhibit 9 wording of your resolution? That is correct. Yes. Yeah. Comments? That's your second, Malta. Yes, my second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The next item, uh, uh, number eight, uh, report from planning director on board actions and other matters. Uh, thank you, commissioners. I, I would just, before they all assemble and leave, like to thank Lorraine and Katie and, of course, Keith and Bruce for their um, really amazing work on this project. It does seem like ordinances of this type would be rather benign, but you can see that they're very complex. They take a lot of work, and I, and I think the unsung heroes in a lot of this is also County Council who we need to recognize. Both Robert and Linda do so much work behind the scenes on these ordinance amendments to make sure when they come here they're in uh, good form and legally defensible, so we're very happy to have this whole team bring you things like this. I wanted to, to start out with that and then um, Thank you. just 
continuing on with that. Um, you can see the complications in these kinds of, of ordinance amendments, and we have several of them coming your way. So hopefully the next time we meet or the time after, we'll have a, a kind of a list and a timeline of when we expect those things to come your way. They're going to include things such as the uh, landscaping guideline update, the open space assembly use update, uh, tree protection, scenic resource protection, um, wildlife migration. It, they're very complex work going on in the planning department right now, and so we want to get those items on your radar. <clears throat> as far as the uh, grant programs right now, um, we have Coastal Impact Assistant grant money in. Uh, we have, as part of that proposal, we hope to uh, take on some portions of the county's LCP, our local coastal plan, which we don't do very often. It's very comprehensive timely, expensive, and uh, um, we're hoping to do that with a little bit of this grant money. Um, the Get to Excellence is, is going on. Um, I hope to also bring you back in the next meeting or two some of the metrics that we've run, some of the very important items that have happened on that, the, the county's new application, the one-stop uh, um, fee payment, the Development Review Committee, these kind of things, um, some of the big items that we've taken on, it's been about six months, so we want to bring back a report on how that's going. Um, a big push in that project was to get items complete within the first 30 days, or so they wouldn't be so, uh, stick around in the planning department with a long history of incompleteness. So we're really pushing hard on that. We're running the numbers all the time, uh, going back on the incomplete case cases to the managers, back to the new case committee to really figure out why the older cases still remain incomplete and seeing what we can do to uh, either get the studies or get what we need from the applicant side to, to begin processing some of those older cases. Um, some of the good work that's coming up in the Get to Excellence um, is the standard conditions and the standard mitigation measures. So all of the county agencies are going to get together once again and sit down and write their agencies standard conditions for track maps, for subdivisions, for CUPs, for PDs. So we can expect the same things from the fire department, from the sheriff's department, from the planning department, and then everybody will have the same standard conditions, and then there'll be specific conditions to that specific case. But I think it will be much easier for the applicants and the development community and the planning department to uh, to kind of corral that issue on standard and uh, conditions and mitigation measures. And then once that part is done, there's a lot of work being done in the background about enforcement of those conditions. So we actually have you know, the position in the planning department of uh, the condition compliance officer who's now reviewing the hundreds of permits that we have active in the planning department to make sure all those conditions are being followed. And, and we're actually keeping track and seeing some lessons learned of conditions that were you know, written even five years ago, but really 10, 15 years ago that we're enforcing now that are really uh, difficult to enforce, and we can see that in the way we write them. So we're taking fresh looks all the time and then pulling those conditions out. There's going to be different training and a higher standard of training for the planning department and the folks that write mitigations to make sure, um, not just for the planning department, but for all the other agencies, to make sure that what we're writing and saying is, is going to be good not only for tomorrow, but five or 10 years down the road. So a lot of work being happening in the planning department right now. And that's the update that I have for you. Do you have anything for me? No, very good. I'd so like to, uh, yeah, I'd like to say something, uh, Kim. I'd like to compliment you on what's going on in planning right now. It just seems like, as I hear you, listen to you now, and as I've seen and read some of the stuff you've just, you've shared with the commission on what's going on and the direction you're going, it must seem to staff maybe you're going to mock or warp speed, but <laughs> but uh, I, I'm sure it's very done very very appropriate and necessarily, and, and uh, you're going in a real positive direction, um, and I'm glad to see that, that it's moving. Um, I mean, I read the LA Times and see what's going on in mm -hmm. Orange County, and I, and I think, boy, did we dodge that one. Um, Anyway, thank you, thank you and your staff. Uh, I really appreciate it as, as a commissioner, I'm sure, I'm sure we all do. I did have a question, um, mm -hmm. and it's something I can probably shoot to you um, electronically. Uh, I, I have uh, a couple of people that asked me about specific uh, construction permit violations in my general geographical area where I live. 
Uh, can I shoot you that, that request to find out what's happened with a couple of, couple of cases that were apparently were cited or were noticed and nothing has transpired or visibly transpired? to get an update. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. I, can, I can get you an update on that or I can point you in the right direction if it's a building uh, violation. All, all violations now are handled in our code compliance unit, so right. um, send it to me and I'll shoot it to the appropriate okay. person to get a response I'll, I'll back. I'll verify the addresses in question and I'll shoot it to you. Very good. Thank and then you. just for the agenda that we have coming up, um, there's a, a hearing that we have on the 24th. I understand Commissioner Onstott is not going to be here. He's let us know that. Is everybody else going to be here on the 24th? That's 24th or 23rd? I'm sorry, I have it on the 24th Thursday, on my agenda. Is the 23rd? Or am I, in, am I incorrect? Today is the 10th. It's got to be a 24th. So it's, 24th. 24th. it's got to be a 24th. Yeah. What we have on there is the uh, 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 track map in Santa Rosa Valley and a, a variance. So I know that we're going to have one planning commissioner down. Is everybody else going to be here on the 24th? I'm going to try. That's the fourth Thursday of the month, I believe. That's usually a probably. difficult one for me. Uh, yeah, I will. I will know uh, more probably the first part of next week, and I can let you know. Okay, that's all right. Okay. It's uh, it, usually it's locked down, but now it's become a 50-50 deal. So I'll know Monday, Monday or Tuesday. Okay. Right. And then the next thing we have on is the October first item that we. Uh, uh, that was the ecologics project that was supposed to be heard today, but it's going to be heard on the first. Um, and I want to, to uh, thank Chair Rodriguez for his comments and really say that the, the good work in the planning department is being done really with the support of the CEO's office and the agency directors really allowing us to have this latitude to go out to agencies other than the planning department and really as the county as a whole come together. And I think um, that's been the difference and that's been the, been the shift and we're really pleased about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Uh, the, next, so the next meeting is September 24th? Absolutely, right. yep. Okay. We're standing adjourned.